welcome to the part five of the advanced defined variants. We had uh, four streams before, uh, two were focused on intro to fuzzing, intro to echidna, um, how to apply echidna to ABDK math. Uh, part three and four were based on Uniswap. And for this week, we're going to be working on um, looking at a primitive, a protocol, and then looking at how to apply properties to it. I'm Nat, I'm a security engineer too at Trail of Bits. Um, at Trail of Bits, we work um, with helping developers to build safer software. So we're trying to use the, safe, the latest programming techniques um, to essentially help developers maintain that safe uh, life cycle. So you're probably familiar with Slither, Echidna, um, static analysis and fuzzing for smart contracts. Um, but we also do a variety of other work um, on other blockchains like Taylor um, with tools like Taylor and Amarna. Um, on the left hand side, there's just a list of people um, who have either done the previous streams um, or just uh, Twitter handles to follow. Um, on the streaming chat, um, we will have people answering echidna questions um, as well as folks on the primitive side who are able to answer uh, more specific ones. So we've got quite the agenda for today. Um, so I'm just going to give um, a brief overview of what we plan to go through. Uh, so a brief recap of fuzzing, um, what is echidna, how we're going to make use of it. We're going to look at uh, primitive as an ecosystem um, and what that uh, product essentially entails, and then um, look at the architecture. So we're going to focus on what the code does, how we can go through the process of finding invariants, um, go through kind of a code walkthrough of the core protocol that we plan, or the core part of the protocol that we plan to test today. And then we're just going to write invariants, um, run them, and, and essentially see what that process is like um, in live time. So at, at the end, at the, at, in order to start with fuzzing, you really need to know what are your invariants, what are your system properties, and identify what, what, they're supposed, what the system is supposed to do in plain English. So this starts out with understanding the system and understanding essentially what's expected to happen. Once you have that knowledge, then you can start converting your properties into code, into something that Echidna can parse and actually understand. Once you provide that to Echidna, um, you can run it, and Echidna will help you find bugs, um, find corner cases in which um, the state might not be as you expect, um, or that a function didn't quite behave correctly. So to start off, fuzzing versus unit testing is often a comparison that people make. Um, and there is a slight differentiation there because unit testing you are generating, essentially, you have an input, uh, you're calling a function, and you ex you're expecting, you're testing against um, an expected behavior. So something, um, either an output or um, the state of the system. With fuzzing, um, you have a larger input space that you can test against because you can generate um, on a random input. Um, you're still going to call a function. Um, but Echidna will be able to use heuristics to determine cases in which um, the system might behave unexpectedly um, or in a way that's not really um, the intended behavior. So um, a comparison to make with Echidna and um, other fuzzers Echidna is quite a bit more mature. Um, it allows us to test uh, gas assumptions between uh, different functions, and it doesn't really have a limitation on compilation framework. So you can pretty much start writing Echidna test for any kind of code base. Um, as we've seen in some previous streams, there are different APIs that can be used for testing. Um, and this is, this is something that Echidna allows us um, kind of more customization. Um, 
and it also supports HEVM and DAP tool cheat codes. So because today we're going to be looking at a fairly complex code base, um, I just want to recap how we've been thinking about invariants throughout the past four streams um, and how we can kind of look at invariants in a way that, or find invariants in a way that's actually um, intuitive. So with primitive today, we're going to be starting with a small component. This is a library that's used within the code base as opposed to um, hitting kind of the, the core logic at first. Um, this helps us understand what's the expected behavior within a contained subset of your of the primitive code, um, which then means it's easier to reason about and it's easier to start writing invariants on. Another thing that helps is analyzing all the preconditions and postconditions of those functions in a code base um, because they tell you what is the say what is the expected input space, what is the expected output space. Um, what is expected to happen essentially once that function executes. Um, kind of contained within the precondition um, is determining what is the safe bound of an input. So if you take, for example, you went 256, what is considered if there's casting or is the, if there's any kind of unit conversion, what is, what is a safe bound um, of that system? In some cases in the system, you will also find inversely related functions um, this would be maybe one function that executes one operation and then on the other, on the second function reverses it. So something like a conversion of string to integer and then integer to string, um, or perhaps more complicated, like with um, a DeFi protocol, you can put in funds and then you can remove funds. This would be an example of functions that are inverse, inversely related. This, putting this context and thinking about contracts in this way allow us to kind of take a step back and see what the expected behavior of the system is. Um, and another thing that helps is focusing on um, the happy paths and the unhappy paths. So what is expected um, within the system? To start off with, um, I did mention tests should always have the precondition, the action, and the postcondition. The precondition essentially allows us to scope out the input space um, so we know what is the expected safe range. The action tells us what, what are we testing, and the postcondition tells us what's true after we actually execute that specific action. This is um, an output from Echidna's coverage file. Um, which is generated within an HTML um, and allows us to determine essentially what lines may have been hit with Echidna, which is deterministic of the uh, stars on the left and um, text being outlined in green, um, highlighted in green. Anything that's marked with an R um, means Echidna uh, was able to hit this code, but reverted. Um, and anything marked in red is uh, lines of code that weren't actually tested and hit by Echidna. Um, we're going to be seeing the use of this coverage afterwards um, and seeing what, how we can use that output to determine um, how we're using Echidna. I will add a disclaimer before we walk into primitive that this stream is very complicated, that the code is can be sometimes can be quite hard to follow. Um, so I highly recommend cloning the repo, um, which is at Echidna Streaming Series, uh, part five, um, and just follow along with uh, pretty much all the code that I'm writing. Um, it's okay if you don't understand it on the first um, first time. This is going to be recorded, um, where you can reference it afterwards. Um, another thing is that all of the uh, comments that I add within um, the, con the contracts are also been um, pushed on this repo. So you can also reference back um, essentially at the, what the architecture um, and what the system does. So before I get into the core concepts of primitive, um, are there any questions? 
So Primitive is a replicating market maker and it implements Black Shirl's interest options. Now that's a huge mouthful, so we're going to take a step back and really identify what that means. If we compare Uniswap and Primitive, in Uniswap, the price of a token is going to change on every swap. So you create a pool, a pool has two tokens, um, and the, the price of each token essentially changes um, when, when a swap is executed. So these pools don't actually have a concept of time. There's no time bound in a Uniswap pool. It's just this pool exists, so therefore users can interact with it. In Primitive, on the other hand, the price changes on the swap, which matches Uniswap, but it also changes over a period of time. So it means at maturity time, the pool will essentially consist of a single token, an underlying token. Um, this time aspect is what makes Primitive um, much harder to test and, act and, and actually reason through. So just to, to put this in perspective, um, this is the price curve of uh, Curve, Uniswap, and RMM is the protocol that we're going to be testing right now um, on Primitive and talking about. Um, one thing we see with this uh, Uniswap invariant or Uniswap curve is that it has a, it has a very different sloping point than Primitive um, or even Curve. So each of these has a way that they essentially quantify um, and determine the value of assets. Um, what you can see within the purple lines is that the RMM is going to continue to change. Um, so we see three different curves here, um, which means it starts out with uh, this first curve um, and over time progresses and com until it completely flattens out and is linear. Now that also begs the question of where and why does that logic come in? So I will take a step back and say primitive is um, allows us to create two pools um, it, and it doesn't rely on oracles. So it relies solely on spot price. Um, it relies on a series of other variables that define um, that curve. And the, the curve essentially allows the asset to be um, closer to its actual market rate. Um, the maturity is essentially specifying um, that point in time in which that curve is going to be linear, the strike price defines how much that asset will be worth at its maturity, which means the price curve is going to continue uh, to converge to the strike price um, at maturity. So the Black-Scholes option um, was another phrase that was used at the beginning. And this is how primitive determines the price change over time. So the price change relies on a series of variables. Um, I, I alluded to a strike price before. Implied volatility is essentially how much the asset is expected to change price over time. Um, time to expiry or maturity uh, refers to essentially the same um, time in which the pool is going to have a linear um, curve. And then the spot price of the underlying asset. So that's also um, kind of very high level. So we can take one example in which a pool consists of uh, USDC and ETH um, with a strike with an intended strike price of 3000 USDC. If we set a maturity of 100 days with an implied volatility of 150%, then this is what the curves look like um, from when the pool is created um, at two points in time when the pool is created and when the pool hits maturity. So on the two axes, we, on the two axes, we have uh, the USDC and ETH. Um, and what this essentially means is that at maturity date, um, USDC will have a price point of 3000 um, and the pool will not hold any ETH. Whereas at um, creation, the pool allows you to add liquidity um, and swap against this curve, um, at which point it will completely flatten out uh, once you hit maturity. So this is an example of what 
is what impact that change of the curve has um, on on the price. So if we were to sell uh, one ETH at 2,500 USD, then these numbers, essentially, these uh, days essentially refer to the time to maturity. So this red curve is basically saying this is when the pool is created. This is the curve in which the pool starts with. Um, and for one ETH, we can get 2,425 USDC. Um, over the progression of time, um, we're going to progress progressively get more USDC until at maturity, we will get 3,000 ETH. Um, this is the impact of um, how time fits in within primitive. So this um, graph then brings together uh, what I previously mentioned with uh, expectations on a curve having a strike price, um, gamma, maturity, and um, essentially a concept of assets. This is how the curve prices assets and determines um, pretty much how, uh, what, is the, what is expected um, behavior of the curve. Um, any questions about that so far? Sounds good. Um, yeah, I can. So uh, one question was um, given like what happens um, to the other asset uh, once. So the pool itself is holding an option towards the underlying equity. Um, what happens at expiry? When a pool is created uh, from time zero up until right before maturity, the pool consists of, in this case, USDC and ETH. Um, at maturity, pri the pri because the price of uh, USDC is essentially going to, um, it's going to converge on that, that 3,000, which means for arbitragers, uh, there's no incentive to hold that ETH and therefore the pool um, will liquidate all, its, all of its positions in ETH. So basically the trading point for USDC is right at this 3000 value. Um, so the, the essentially the difference between pre-maturity and post-maturity is that pre-maturity, um, you're going to see that, uh, sorry, the other way, uh, that curve continue to change. Um, and then at maturity and after that point afterwards. Um, then essentially the, the price point is uh, exactly equivalent to strike price. That being said, there are more uh, intricate details related. Th this is kind of uh, keeping it high level, but if um, I do also have um, a link in here to the primitive white paper, which I highly recommend um, looking at if you do want kind of the, the um, more specific mathematical details, but at a high level, um, at maturity, the second asset is essentially, th there will be only be one asset within this pool. And in this case would be USDC. Um, so this, this slide uh, kind of sums it up. This slide is um, essentially showcasing the fact that assets can't be bought or sold um, after maturity um, and the, the pool doesn't hold a balance of this uh, second asset. Um, are there any other questions about primitive itself before I start walking into architecture? All right, perfect. Um, so just to, now that we understand how primitive works, uh, we can start looking at what the system looks like, uh, what contracts are actually involved in um, looking at primitive. 
So the, it basically consists of the core system and a periphery set of contracts, uh, a periphery contract, the manager. Because um, in the primitive ecosystem, you can create multiple pools. Um, a pool is essentially the concept of an engine, um, which is why we have this factory. Factories create engines, um, which essentially allow you to, to interact with multiple pools. For the purposes of um, this stream, we're going to be focusing primarily on the engine, um, just so that we can test the core logic of um, the functions that we expect uh, the engine to actually execute. The manager is provides periphery contracts to call the engine. Um, these are essentially helpers, wrappers um, that help make that call um, easier to perform. When you create a new, this engine uh, contract essentially allows a series of um, operations, which include creating a pool, um, adding and removing liquidity from a pool, uh, swapping tokens, and then depositing withdrawing from the engine. Um, so from a behavior perspective, um, we're going to go into more detail as to what these um, operations actually entail. When you create a new pool, uh, you're specifying a series of um, parameters that essentially define how the pool is expected to function. One of these, um, th one set of these arguments includes the tokens, um, which are the underlying and the quote token. Note here that uh, underlying is essential is the um, the order of the underlying and the quote token matter, um, which we'll be looking at um, when we take a brief look at the actual code. It relies on strike price, which is how much the asset is worth um, at maturity, and in that previous example was uh, three thousand USDC. Um, if we tie back to the tokens, the underlying would be the USDC and the quote token would be ETH. Implied volatility defines how much that price curve is expected to change. So if we take uh, the curve, what, what the curve started out with, um, implied volatility defines how fast um, that curve or how, what slope of the curve um, is going to change over time until that maturity date. Um, maturity is essentially that uh, date in which, or that time in which that pool is considered to be in that new state um, of, of having a, a completely linear curve. And uh, one other um, variable that's considered is gamma, which is the trading fee percentage. Um, and this defines essentially how much is taken for trading fees. Um, there is much more nuance to gamma um, for the entire system, but for the purposes of just explaining um, how we can get invariance on it, up on this code base, I'm going to skip um, the what, what and how gamma falls into um, the progression of um, maturity. I did also reference the primitive white paper um, in case anyone wants to take a closer look at uh, how, how all of these variables come into creating the, the curve. Um, and the white paper also references um, all of these values by name. So the, the terminology is constant uh, throughout the code and through the white paper. So once you have a curve in this, um, you can essentially create curves. So you can put money um, into the system and then you can supply and remove tokens uh, to that specific curve and you can swap. So that's, that's essentially assuming you've created a curve, um, you can add and remove um, and then you can swap. This particular slide differentiates um, the concept of an engine and the concept of a pool. 
um, primitive right now uses uh, primitive uses 0 0.8, um, which is a, a safe math, um, which has safe math, which means um, which is just something to keep in mind um, when we're looking at this code. The differentiation here with deposit and withdraw is that you can deposit into an engine, you can deposit and withdraw into an engine, but if you want to allocate and remove, that's happening to a pool. So you can allocate funds to a pool um, and, then, and then swap. So the, there's no concept of uh, swapping an engine per se. Um, you're always going to be um, essentially requiring to put funds in the system um, and then put funds into the pool. Um, so I'll pause here for questions quickly. Um, we got one. Yep. Um, Im is implied volatility, um, just so I understand, implied volatility isn't actually implied in this case. Um, there is a lot of nuance in uh, the calculations of these values um, that essentially define how the pool is created. Um, it is not necessarily implied. This is something that uh, perhaps you could better say calculated. Um, I, can, I will also link uh, a primitive primer, which explains um, a few example, a few case studies of how um, how implied volatility and strike price might be determined, um, and it provides a, a overview of um, essentially the one user who uh, puts money into the pool and kind of compares uh, what happens after maturity, and then um, another user who puts it into a more risky pool. Um, so the the concept of like a risky pool perhaps um, is is harder to define because um, they're essentially implied by by the configuration of these values. Um, these values essentially determine um, how how that curve is expected to change, um, which the white paper and I believe the primer um, can provide a lot of color there as well. All right, so uh, one question that often comes up is that if uh, in order to allocate to a pool, you have to split up the deposit and allocate. So from this example, it essentially looks like you have to deposit into the engine first um, and then allocate money to a pool to actually fund it, um, which the reasoning for actually splitting up the deposit and the allocate um, means that a user can um, save gas on depositing into the engine at any point in time that they prefer. Um, this allows users flexibility um, in how they interact with the pool, and we're going to be looking at the allocate function um, in depth just to see how it works um, and, and how that fits in. So I did say uh, one thing within these invariants is that it's better to start out with the libraries and um, essentially contracts that are um, isolated within the code base so we can really start to uh, think about how what the expected behavior is. So this slide just provides a little bit of context as to what um, libraries exist in the code base. Um, so there's um, mathematics, there's primitive math, which um, is undergoing um, an update for V2. Um, we're going to be primarily focusing on uh, mar on balances within the system that store like how much liquidity a pool um, contains and essentially the storage of um, pool data structures. Um, but there's also safe cast uh, transfers and unit conversions. So this, these are all helpers um, that kind of help, help um, primitive determine um, either how to cast or how to do casting safely. So with that, we can actually start looking at the code um, and we can really start taking a look at uh, what the system is supposed to do.
So this engine contract is basically the starting point for um, how we can start reasoning about um, these pools. It has a, um, a series of helper functions that help us determine um, balances of each of, each of the tokens. Um, if we look at the create, the create takes those few values that we started with, um, that we started reasoning about a pool with. Um, these essentially match the white paper um, directly. These help us define uh, what that curve is going to look like um, and how that curve is going to change um, until maturity. It's going to do a series of data validation, which I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail for today. Um, that will be the focus of the stream for next week. Um, but assuming all the data validation and all the incoming arguments are correct, um, what it's going to do is create um, and save all of this state. So at the end of the day, we have um, a pool exists. Um, a pool essentially has some amount um, of liquidity associated with it. Um, and it's going to call this reserves.allocate. This reserve.allocate is going to, is essentially taking um, a reserve object, uh, which we can find uh, here. It tracks um, how much uh, risky token we have uh, within that pool, how much stable token we have what's the total supply of liquidity within the pool. Um, Block.timestamp is just going to save the last time um, this pool was interacted with. And then it's going to uh, save the cumulative sum of the, both the, or all of the risk you reserve and total liquidity. So if we go back to the allocate, it's basically taking a reserve object, uh, taking in the amount of tokens that we want to allocate to the pool. So this is an amount of token that we actually want to add uh, to the pool, um, liquidity and um, timestamp, which is used to update that local variable. So from a high level, what this is essentially going to um, do is allocate risky and stable tokens to the reserve. Um, and then it's going to actually execute that token transfer. So this is um, a pattern that's used throughout the code base, um, which is to um, do ERC20 transfers in a slightly uh, more gas efficient way, which is rely on a callback, um, which has uh, like a risky token and a stable token transfer, um, executes that on the target calling um, and then checks the balance. So there's an inherent assumption um, that the callback there's an inherent assumption that the callback executes transfers to the engine, um, which means that the callback will have um, risky token um, like dot transfer uh, from like the uh, sender to the engine. Um, this is a pattern to keep in mind um, within this code base. Any questions about this so far? All right, perfect. There's um, the, this is the deposit function, which I alluded to earlier. Um, if we take a very quick look, um, it basically ensures that the amount that you want to deposit, um, so the Dell risk, one thing um, to keep in mind with this uh, within this code base is that the risky token doesn't necessarily mean that that token is riskier than the other. Um, this is just terminology that's used in the code base to distinguish um, one token versus the other. Um, so this incoming argument for uh, Dell Risky is basically saying the um, amount of risky token to be added um, to be deposited into the um, engine specifically. 
and then this uh, stable is the amount of stable token to be deposited. What this uh, check is going to do is um, essentially make sure that these values are non-zero, um, update the margins, um, which has a very similar structure to the reserves, um, and then rely on a similar callback that we saw uh, with the create. Because I'm not I'm primarily going to be focusing on invariance targeting the allocate and the reserve. Um, I'm just going to um, skip over this section. Um, but the withdraw is essentially meant to be the uh, exact opposite of what's expected to happen um, for the withdraw. So this is um, this is the the core logic that we we want to look at today. This allocate function um, is going to take a pool ID. Um, this pool ID is what was changed within that create. So this is uh, the pool ID that we actually want to deposit into. Um, it's going to take the recipient uh, whose reserves, essentially whose um, yeah, reserves you want to deposit to. The risky is going to take the amount of risky token that you want to allocate to the pool. So this is putting essentially how much risky token um, the balances of risky and stable um, into the pool for uh, these two deltas. We're going to skip from margin for now, um, but the allocate has an option where you can either take it from an existing deposit um, or choose to take that from another um, source. Um, through like transferring immediately. Um, and call data is uh, essentially call data that's going to be used on the callback. So if we start taking a look at um, what, the, what this uh, code is actually expected to do, um, we need to start off with the preconditions, what, what the code validates and what the code checks, um, which we can start off with this uh, this line. If either of the amounts that a user wants to allocate into a pool for its risky or its stable token are zero, um, then it means this function is expected to revert. We expect this, um, which means that we can then say that the amount that you want to, ex to add into a pool, um, so del risky and del stable, need to be greater than zero. Um, in order for, for this um, allocate to be successful. This um, line is essentially going to retrieve reserves for that pool um, and basically make sure that um, the block timestamp is not zero. If it is zero, then it means the pool doesn't exist. Um, but because right now we're just going to be primarily looking at the reserves, um, I'm just gonna, this note is just here for an invariant for like an end-to-end -end, um, test suite. But at a high level, it's just that a pool, um, you can say either must exist or has to have been created. Um, there has to be a create call for that. Um, and this is particularly where um, the calculation for the amounts gets uh, really interesting. The liquidity zero um, is basically taking the amount that we want to add into the amount of risky tokens we want to add to the pool, um, multi multiplying it by the amount of liquidity in the pool, and then dividing it by the amount of reserves. So this, in a nutshell, is the calculation of the risky spot, the risky token spot price. Um, this is essentially saying this is how much the asset is worth right now in this pool. Um, and we can say this exact same thing about um, the, the stable. So it does the uh, similar calculation, except that it um, uses the, the stable um, instead of the, the reserves. Um, the change in liquidity is going to be considered uh, the minimum of either the risky uh, or the token spot price. This variable, um, if we go back to our allocate, 
is going to define how much this liquidity is worth. Um, so this is the amount of uh, liquidity that's considered added within these tokens. When we, um, so this, this then begs the question of um, the reason it chose the minimum was in case there was any kind of rounding um, issues with, uh, in case there were any issues in which this token in liquidity zero or one rounded up, um, the delta liquidity would essentially choose the minimum of the two. Um, so it cho chooses the one that's least, um, that's the potential least amount of dust. The execution is then going to assume, um, make sure that the delta liquidity is not uh, zero. If it is zero, then there's nothing that we're adding. To the, we're, we should never be able to allocate to a pool um, if the liquidity, if the delta liquidity, the change in liquidity is zero. Um, and then it's going to call this allocate function, um, which we can take a look at here. This function, uh, for the purposes of um, this this testing suite, I'm going to skip this update. Um, skip the update check, but at a high level, it's going to increase. Um, it's basically taking your reserve risk key and adding the amount that you want to add. So then your reserve um, risk key should increase after an allocate. Um, you can say the same thing about the res reserve stable. Um, and then you can say the same thing about your liquidity balance. Now that we have an idea of you know, what the expected behavior of this allocate function is, then we can really start to think about um, what are the preconditions required for an allocate, um, what is expected to happen when an allocate happens, and then what is the expected output of the allocate. So we, for that, we can really just go back to pretty much all the lines in which we saw this invariant. Um, so we can... Um, change the order. We can copy um, this line so that essentially your del risky and your del stable have to be greater than zero. Um, you can, this calculation, um, because it's an end-to-end -end invariant and we, we're not going to be testing pool creation, um, we can skip. And this del liquidity, um, this, is, this is essentially you know, how much liquidity um, is, ex is expected to be in the system, um, to be added to the system. So we can um, add that as well. Our action, uh, very similar to this function, um, is just going to call this reserve allocate, which we can copy. Um, and then we can see what was the output that we thought that the allocate should execute, um, which is essentially all of these balances should increase, um, which means that we can then make the assumption that uh, reserve risk key, reserve stable, and liquidity should increase. Just to recap, um, what this basically means is that the incoming argument that Echidna generates has to be great. The, the amount that's being added into a pool has to be greater than zero. The total change in liquidity from these two values has to also be greater than zero. And once we allocate funds into this pool, that the reserves for these um, the updated reserves should have increased by the amount that we added um, in both tokens and the delta liquidity. Any questions there? All right, perfect. Which means we can then just start filling in um, pretty much how we can test these invariants. So one thing um, that 
came up in the Uniswap streams and I think in ABTK math as well, was this between function, um, which we can essentially take a random number and bound it between um, a, an input size. So a lower bound and an upper bound, um, which we're just going to use um, to, to make sure that the risky and the stable are greater than zero. That being said, you could do something like risky L risky is greater than zero. Um, it just means that echidna uh, would revert essentially every time it found uh, this case. Uh, whereas if we use something like del risky is between um, one and something, that echidna will guarantee to off also to always bound it above one. Now, this brings up an interesting question of what our bound should be. Right now, it's bound um, to the max u into 56. Um, in order to figure out what that bound needs to be, we can then just take a look at um, what the, the data structure looks like in the reserve. So it takes in, interestingly, it takes in a u into 56 as an argument. Um, but what we see here is that it's actually casting, it's downcasting back to a 128. Um, and then we can take a look at this uh, reserve object, which is also a 128, which means that we can almost split up our input space um, into something that's um, between 1 and u and 128, um, which was that maximum uh, bound here. And we can split it up into 128 to uh, u and 256. So that means that now Echidna has a, a, a different path that it can explore. So for um, simplicity's sake, I'm just going to say this is our safe version of the reserve allocate, um, which is going to test um, essentially u and 128, uh, 1 to u and 128 max. Um, if we had time, uh, there would be another function that would test uh, that, that last bound. Um, between 128 and 256, just making sure um, the that the casting would work. Um, but this is something that we can keep in mind because then we can um, essentially bound what what this input is. Um, so we're going to be focusing on um, this particular bound which means we can then just bound it, um, bound del risky. So now this uh, this will guarantee that del risky is always between one and two, uh, and the maximum 128. We can do the same thing about uh, the del stable, which brings us into this delta liquidity needs to be greater than zero. But at this point, we don't actually know what delta liquidity is because if we look at um, the reserves, delta liquidity is something that's calculated elsewhere and sent in. Um, so for that, we can just look at the engine. And this is where the minimum uh, spot price or the minimum price of the two tokens, spot price of the two tokens comes in. So then we can just actually just copy um, what was in the engine um, directly. The Dell stable or the Dell liquidity is now just going to be exactly equal to uh, what this, uh, what the engine provided, um, and then we can make that check. We can um, essentially have that uh, delta liquidity. Um, if it is greater than zero, then um, we have a problem. So for that, we can just say if it is actually equal to zero, um, then this function shouldn't really be uh, like this this execution isn't going to be successful um, so we know that from the code base now um, just to take a step back what we have we have now implemented all of the preconditions that we need we had our precondition of these two incoming arguments have to be between one and 
a, a certain bound. Um, um, this is essentially going to bound it to 128. Uh, and then it's going to calculate the change in liquidity um, and take the minimum. So now we have pretty much the arguments set up um, for this, this function. Um, now, what is our action? We just need to call uh, reserve.allocate. Reserve.allocate is essentially this exact line here. Um, This reserve.allocate takes this uh, incoming amount that we want to add to the pool, um, amount of both tokens that we want to add to the pool, uh, liquidity, and a timestamp. Um, again, for simplicity, I'm just going to skip um, the check on this update. But what we can see is that it's a blocked out timestamp. Um, so we don't really have to mock it. We can just say. Um, we can either take the current blocked out timestamp and just um, add a thousand, but to keep it simple, we can even just mock it even simpler to a thousand. So if we think about um, what this what this function is actually doing, the allocate function is increasing your reserves for the token, the two tokens that you're adding in their respective amounts as well as the liquidity that you're adding, which means um, sh we, can, we can be more specific about should increase. Um, what we're really saying, uh, what we're really saying is that the pre-allocate uh, reserve in terms of uh, reserve risky balance. Um, so it's, that's essentially if you were to take a snapshot um, right before the allocate at this point. If you were just to take a snapshot of what this pool looks like um, and what the reserves look like, then reserve, dot re reserve risky um, plus the amount that we added into the pool um, which we know is del risky is equivalent to the second snapshot. So if we were to take another snapshot um, of what the pool looks like here, then we can essentially just say reserve risky um, amount is equivalent. Um, so this is the post allocate, which, which makes sense from a theoretical perspective because we're basically saying, um, you know, take the status of the pool beforehand execute your allocate, which uh, increase those balances, um, and then check that the, that the balances have actually increased, which then we can make that assumption on the reserve uh, stable as well. Um, this would be the amount of stable token added, uh, which maps to uh, del stable, which then we can say maps to the reserve amount. Um, and in a similar way, similar way, we can say the same with liquidity. Um, just instead of amount stable, it'd be del liquidity that was calculated uh, here. Any questions about that so far? Sounds good. Um, so this gives us an idea of uh, what the snapshot is, um, essentially what the pool is expected to, what the outcome um, is that the, the two balances, um, the liquidity, um, what the two balances should be. Um, what we need to do now is know what this pool looked like before. What was the state of the pool before the allocate? For that, we can just save, um, an object that said just this is the pre allocate reserves. Um, we could just set it to essentially the reserve. So, what this is doing is um, essentially this is this is the snapshot. This is taking um, what that reserve is 
and the reserve the the allocate function is basically taking um, that uh, reserve object and with the incoming arguments. So one minor change that we do have to make here, uh, the primitive engine is using the reserve as a library and we're just calling functions on it. Um, so we would just need to um, essentially in invoke the function. Um, and then we're going to send uh, the reserve object in place. So what is the reserve object? Um, well, we can just create um, create like a reserve data. Um, Now we can go to um, Echidna um, in a terminal and run this. What this uh, command is doing is basically um, removing the cache and the artifacts, uh, running Echidna with a corpus enabled and specifying test mode assertion, um, which is essentially means for uh, these preconditions, we're going to be checking, uh, we're going to be at using assert in uh, assertion mode uh, which I'll be going through um, in a little bit. So I'm just going to let that run um, while we fill out uh, what we mean by these last post conditions. Um, now that we've saved this pre-allocate reserve, we've got this snapshot, and we know that the reserve updated um, its values in place, which means um, the snapshot of the pool is in this reserve um, variable, which then um, I will let um, Akita run. Um, our assert, if we were to just um, map what these values um, are related to, it be essentially the pre-allocate reserves. Um, and if we need a refresher, the reserve risky is the one that holds the, the token reserve of how much risky exists in the system. Um, so we can just say reserve risky, um, add the delta risky amount, and check that's equal to the current um, snapshot of the pool. So that would be reserve dot reserve risky. We can say the same. We can make the same assumption on um, the stable. The only difference is that um, we're taking essentially the the stable um, balances here. So we're comparing um, the stable amount. Um, then we can we can essentially say the same thing about um, liquidity. The slight difference in naming liquidity is essentially referring to the total supply, um, which then means we can just refer to uh, liquidity here, add the amount of liquidity that we wanted to add to the system and compare it to liquidity. This means um, from a high level, this reserve allocate function is then uh, first checking that um, our variables are within the safe bounds um, does a calculation which matches what happened in the pool with um, essentially what is the expected um, liquidity change. It calls this uh, reserve allocate function um, with uh, changes directly to the reserve um, with a timestamp. Um, and then it's going to essentially assert that the balance before, so this was the snapshot uh, before the allocate actually happened, um, and you add the, the balances of the two tokens um, are equivalent to essentially the current state of the system. So we're taking these two snapshots and we're comparing um, to make sure the difference is equivalent. Um, note that you could also rearrange this to say um, that the pre-allocate reserves would be equal to the current like, post-allocate reserves minus del uh, risky. Um, the intuition would be the same there. Any questions about um, that piece? Right, perfect.
So now we can go back to actually running Echidna. Um, but this, this output um, didn't really tell us much because we hadn't written our um, assertions yet. Um, but I will take this opportunity to open up the corpus, um, sorry, the coverage files, um, so that we can see what this we can see what this code looks like um, within the corpus. So um, we can just look for reserve allocate. Recall that um, this reserve allocate, uh, the, sorry, this uh, display is basically telling us um, all the R's are where functions may have reverted. Um, and all the red is telling us where functions may not, uh, where those lines weren't hit at all. Um, so this is telling us something very interesting. This is saying that uh, Echidna actually failed on calculating the spot price of the risky token. Um, this begs the question of why, because Echidna, if Echidna is not actually hitting um, our assertions and not even hitting this allocate call, then Echidna is not really doing anything here. Um, it's, it's just something's happening within this line. So from that, um, we just need to look at what is the system? Uh, what does the system look like? Um, so we can pretty easily do that by um, adding just a, an event um, that allows us to specify like a message and a value. Um, and for here, I'm just going to, it's failing on this specific line, um, which means before that, I'm just going to emit a log in U50, uh, UN256 and um, we already know uh, that like Del Risky is going to be between one and, uh, one and UN128, but we do want to know what is reserve liquidity um, and likely importantly also what is reserve risky um, that would cause this uh, line to, fit, to, to revert silently. Um, and what I'm going to do here is just assert false so that we get those logs and, and see what that output looks like. Um, yes, should definitely be an event. While I let that run, we can also look at this from a manual code review perspective. Our reserve is created um, here. What we're doing is basically uh, if we if we really take a look at what this spot price is doing, um, spot price calculation is taking Del Risky times the total change or the total liquidity um, and dividing it by reserve risky. Um, but at this point in time, and we can just go back to um, not done yet. Um, at this point in time, um, total liquidity and reserve risky are essentially the default values, um, which, spoiler, is actually just everything's initialized to zero, which um, tells us why spot price, the spot price calculation of the risky token is failing um, because we're it's failing with a divide by zero error. Um, this is a pretty simple fix. Um, we can just set up the reserve and mock, mock that input as well. Um, so we can just say reserve uh, risky is equal to say one ether, reserve um, stable is equal to two and reserve liquidity um, is equal to three. This gives us, at, at the very least, a starting value. 
that we can use to actually calculate the spot price of these two tokens. Um, and for simplicity, I'm also just going to uh, create a Boolean that is set to true uh, when, when this function actually runs, um, which gives us one more invariant to, to add, um, or one more precondition to add, um, which is set up um, has to be true. It's not true, it's just going to be everything um, is zero, which um, we can we can we can simplify it by just saying if it's uh, if it's not set up, it just call set up reserved. But this should get us further in the execution. Um, we shouldn't we should no longer fail um, where this sprout price calculation did. Um, we can then also drop assertions. So from um, a system perspective, this reserve allocate is now just making sure that the reserve has balance associated with it, that these two values are um, within their, their safer bounds. Um, calculating the change in liquidity of the minimum um, and the max, the, the minimum of the two risky and stable spot prices um, and then we're taking a, essentially a picture of what the pool looks like. Um, we're calling reserve.allocate, and then we're checking that uh, on the comparison between the pre-allocate and the post-allocate that they're equivalent. Um, any questions there so far? All right, perfect. Um, so in the interest of time, I am um, going to go uh, just go through the remove invariant quite quickly um, using existing code. Um, this from a um, perspective of the allocate is very much the same. Um, the difference would of course be, you know, what is that? What is the allocate calling? Um, well, it's, it's going to call the reserve dot remove um, and the calculation for the respective amount of tokens is going to be different. Um, so what we're going to do um, is essentially doing the same thing, um, making sure that the reserve is set up. You shouldn't be able to remove funds um, if the reserve is, is equal to zero. Um, one thing to keep in mind if we look at the remove function um, it's going to call reserve.getAmounts. It's going to send the amount of liquidity that goes into the pool. If we take a look at getAmounts, um, this function is essentially the function that's being called. What it's doing is the exact opposite of the spot price. Instead of taking, instead of calculating the spot price, it's taking, uh, it's rearranging the formula so that we know how much risky and stable tokens we would get. Um, when we inter when we want to essentially remove that amount of liquidity, if we, if we want to um, receive and remove it, which means that the then calculation um, for the action would essentially allow us um, just to call this reserved up get amounts. We can. Um, Similar to last time, save a snapshot of what happens before the remove, um, calculate the amount of tokens that we should get in exchange, um, and then call reserve.remove. Um, what is this? What is the expected behavior of this call? Well, it's, ident it's almost identical to the allocate, except it's the opposite. We want to check um, essentially that the balances have decreased. Um, which we can essentially do by um, checking that uh, if we take the snapshot of the uh, 
balances before. We're essentially saying that um, that the balance should be less than um, the, the difference. So if we take um, if we take essentially what is expected to happen within uh, the remove, we're basically saying that the current reserve um, token balance is, um, we can actually just make it even simpler um, to almost match this um, pre-allocate instead. Um, in which we take uh, the current balance of the re uh, reserve risky, um, the, sorry, the pre-balance and um, essentially make, ensure that the snapshot of the pre-balance is equivalent. So if we take, um, this making, where am I? Uh, I think I made changes to the wrong function. Um, this remove, we're going to um, essentially check the, we're checking the pre-remove risky balance is equivalent to uh, the current, which was decreased and ensuring that we add funds uh, to make sure that they're equal. This uh, remove function is essentially the exact inverse. Um, we have this allocate function, which executes this. Um, it takes the, it adds funds into uh, the reserves, and then it removes funds in the remove. Um, what I'm going to do next is talk about how we can then integrate um, that check on inverses, because I think that's where um, things get really interesting and we can actually start looking at what the expected behavior is when we um, think about what the system is supposed to do as a whole. Um, so from if we think about a scenario in which we were to allocate funds and then remove funds, the precondition uh, that we would want to check um, would essentially uh, match the bounds. Um, so essentially bound um, the inputs in the same way that we did for the allocate. Um, the action is where things get interesting because we can either say reserve, uh, call reserve.allocate and call reserve.remove, um, which is essentially the, the, the effect of the inverse. Um, in post conditions, what we would want to do is essentially save uh, the, the snapshot of what happened um, at this point, what the system looks like, so we can compare it. Um, now, if we think about the expected behavior of the allocate and the remove, what we really expect is that the pre-allocate and pre-execution state should be equivalent to what happens when you allocate and remove, which means but better um, if you take a snapshot of this pre-allocate state. So this is before anything touches it. This is before we're making calls, um, before any kind of state change. We can save the state um, of essentially what the system looks like. Um, this is going to be snapshot two, which is uh, the post um, remove. So this is after the remove happens. Um, this is after all the state change, um, if we realize that they are actually inverses, then we can basically say snapshot one should equal snapshot two. Um, because at the end of the day, what we're really doing is taking this allocate, adding the amount of tokens that we want to add um, to allocate into the pool, with the change in liquidity and remove is basically doing the exact opposite. Any questions so far? Awesome, sounds good. <laughs>
so let's really think about um, what what this what converting this to code would actually look like. Um, bounding the inputs, we already know how to do that. Uh, we can pretty much just say del risky um, is is between. Um, between your, your, your low, lower bound and your upper bound. Um, we already know how to take a snapshot. So we can say reserve.data, um, essentially the, the pre-allocate reserves um, is equal to the current state. Now, what can we actually, can, what code can we actually use here to call the reserve because we've or call the, the two functions on the reserve because we already have logic um, that ex executes on the allocate and the reserve. Um, so what we can actually do is call a reserve, um, call our version of reserve allocate. The reserve allocate takes a del risky delta in the stable version And I will just run Echidna uh, while we wait, while we uh, continue to build this out. So the reserve allocate is basically, this is, um, we already know what this does. This allocates to the pool. Um, this ensures that the balance increases. But what happens afterwards? The reserve allocate is going to, um, increase our reserves, of course. Um, it's going to um, increase the amount of risky and stable tokens that we want to add, which means um, we can just add a, a return object on this reserve allocate, which would give us uh, the pre-allocate state as well as how much uh, liquidity was actually changed. So this is specifically, we can think of this as the delta liquidity of the allocate function, um, which means that we can then um, essentially remove the pre-allocate um, reserves save the, uh, it's a UN256 um, allocate liquidity not really working, so I'm just going to do this, um, make it more readable. Um, what this means is that we actually have, uh, we, we can get the return value from the reserve allocate, um, which gives us pretty much what, what is the pre-allocate state. Um, we can say this, this gives us the snapshot of pre-allocate reserves. Um, it also gives us the change in liquidity for um, the, the provided risky and stable token. Now recall our changes in um, the allocate function to the risky and the stable. We've bounded that already. Um, so we don't really need to bound that again. Um, which means we have now a snapshot of our reserves. We have the amount of liquidity we want to add. Um, which means the allocates, the, the execution behavior there um, is done. The re reserve remove function takes a delta liquidity and then calls reserve.remove. Now, if we want to test the inverse of the allocate and then the, the remove, we can also then use the return value of um, the allocation of liquidity. So we can even simplify that to del liquidity. Um, and for completeness, let's specify that this is the delta liquidity uh, created and returned uh, by the allocate function. Which then means we can call uh, reserve remove with uh, 
shall allocate liquidity. Yes, this did not compile before. Um, I'll I add comments to this. I'm just going to let that run as well. Um, what this function does is basically uh, removes funds from the pool and ensures that um, the balance then decreases. So this is, uh, again, reusing similar logic that we saw um, that we wrote for the re remove. Now, this is the fun part of like comparing the actual uh, difference between um, what happened, what was the state of the system, the snapshot uh, pre-allocation, and what is the state of the system post-allocation. Um, the tests for that can be straight for pretty straightforward because we already have the allocate reserves. Um, then we can basically um, clarify this to um, the snapshot of the pre-allocate um, on the reserve uh, should be equal to like the current uh, reserve risk. So at this point, it takes the pre-allocation allocation snapshot. We have uh, the post-allocation snapshot, and we can basically just compare them. Um, we can do that by um, taking the reserve risk key, um, ensuring that uh, that is equal to current reserve risky um, because both behavior, both um, the allocate and the remove would have made changes in place. We can do the same thing for the stable token, um, which is a pattern that we see quite often. Uh, and then we can also make that change to the liquidity. Basically what this is doing then is now we're just comparing, we're, we're implementing that snapshot of the reserve risky and the reserve stable. Um, and we can say the same thing about uh, liquidity. So from a high level, what this function, uh, just to recap, is basically save the state, um, save the state of what happens before we do anything. This is uh, the pre-allocate reserves. So this is uh, what are all the values before we actually execute anything. Um, we're getting uh, allocate to create essentially what uh, that what that uh, calculation, we're getting allocate to return that calculation of how much liquidity it has uh, used in exchange for um, the two tokens. And then we're calling reserve.remove with the liquidity um, that was provided by the allocate. What the remove is going to do um, is it then do another set of calculations to figure out uh, how much risky and stable token it should get in exchange. Um, and for missing a semicolon. Um, for the post conditions, what it's basically checking is that the snapshot um, pre-allocate uh, of pre-allocate of all of the specific values that should have been changed are equal um, after the inverse. So we can let that run, um, and immediately what it tells us is that something went wrong. Um, something within the allocate then remove um, with an argument of zero, zero has failed. Um, this doesn't exactly tell us why. So we can start looking at, um, we can start adding more events and try to understand uh, more. So I will first open the corpus. Um, which is generated after um, we halt echidna, 
what we can see uh, with a series of R's is that something um, is that usually the R's will bubble up to where um, if, if it had a specific call stack, the R's will essentially bubble up um, and, and hit each line. So if we just take a look at where the last R is um, in our code base, we can see um, that the pre-allocate reserves of the reserve risky um, seems to have reverted um, for some reason. So we can then add um, more events to determine what might have gone wrong. Um, for this particular example, um, I'm going to use uh, an event that uh, is just named assertion failed, and Echidna will uh, essentially pick this up and fail when it hits it. Uh, you can get it to supply a message, um, and I'm just going to print out what the expected uh, what the expected value and then what the actual value uh, are of each of the variables. So another pattern that we could use here is um, if they're not equal, then I want um, an assertion failed uh, message to be um, assertion failed event to be emitted, where I can compare these two values. I can do simplicity sake the same thing for the rest of them. Once we run um, Once you run Echidna, um, this will give us a better idea as to uh, which which values are not equal, and it gives us an intuition for testing out uh, how we can figure out why. Um, any questions about that so far? All right, perfect. So with this, Echidna told us um, a series of information, which is which is which is quite interesting. Um, that the reserve balances, and we can even just parse this. Um, look. To, to be more readable. Uh, we're basically saying the liquidity amount um, was this amount. I'm just going to drop um, the address for the library math. Um, the reserve risky amount was a certain other amount. Uh, res reserve risky is uh, not equal. So I'm just going to Make this this. All right. So basically what this is saying um, is that the pre-allocate stable um, and pre-allocate liquidity are not equal. Um, so we can take a look at why um, they're basically just saying that the uh, the, the, the value for uh, the assertion, um, the pre-allocate liquidity is zero all around, um, which if it's, uh, we can then also take a look at our corpus 
preserve our page. We can see um, if we take a look at our setup um, function, it's basically um, not being set up correctly. Um, we can basically see that the setup reserve, um, when we go back to our events, pre-allocate um, reserves are not actually being set, which brings us back to um, this allocate function and we can also see that there is no return value. Um, so if we return pre-allocate and the delta liquidity, we run echidna, Zoom that as well. Um, what we can see within the reserve and we can also take a look at our corpus. Um, All right, we can step through, um, pre-allocate. All right, we're going to just take a look at where this is working. Take a look at um, the Reserve allocate, we see a um, revert, which if we go back up to reserve allocate, um, we're essentially res uh, reverting on um, the allocation. I'm just going to then bound um, further bound the risky because I might be hitting a K, uh, the two balances of the tokens um, to an even smaller balance um, within the remove just to give us a safer um, bound to work with. Um, so we can do something like you in 264. While this runs, um, any questions? All right. Um, So essentially we're saving um, the pre-allocate reserves. We are um, saving the liquidity value, uh, calling reserve allocate with the incoming uh, risky and um, stable tokens. Um, we're 
removing the liquidity essentially from the pool. Um, and then we're snapshotting, uh, we're comparing the snapshot between the difference in risky, uh, reserve risky and like the current reserve. Um, So given uh, this particular um, even smaller scoping of the input space, I'm also then just going to um, print out the uh, log of, um, actually, we might have got that from the Echidna run. Um, this is basically saying our reserve liquidity is uh, this large number, reserve risky is um, one, one ether, reserve uh, current reserves are zero. Um, so basically it's erring out on the fact that the pre-allocate reserves have not been have not been initialized. Um, <laughs> so basically what we're seeing is Um, let's log out that uh, risky and stable balance that we're actually uh, sending because here Echidna is saying it sent zero, but it would have been scaled uh, to like a different number. Um, I'm just going to print out the risky and the stable. to rerun this code. And I'm just going to also copy the cleaner version um, of the allocate, which will be a bit more readable. The content of this uh, paste is the exact same. It's just uh, the formatting is formatted in a way that's slightly easier to parse. Um, and should give us additional events as well. Um, so we can figure out uh, why this particular value is zero. So the issue that we're experiencing now is that the pre-allocate reserves um, are essentially zero, uh, comparing like a zero um, against reserves. Um, so what we've done is added a few additional um, events here just to make sure that we have an idea of what the system is uh, looks like, um, which allows us to go into the code and um, try to debug. Um, or pro provide more intuition uh, for debugging. All right. I'm just going to then just format this copying all of the addresses and it should help with readability. Um, what this function is, what this input is telling us um, is that the risky was, um, uh, the, the risky and the stable token, um, even though Echidna sent in 
at the zero zero, which we can see uh, from here. The actual amount that we want to deposit, want to allocate into the system is essentially one uh, Dell Risky token and one Dell Stable token. Um, the reserves um, are now being set correctly. Um, the reserves are now being set correctly and being returned, uh, which means that we now have the ability to um, execute that allocate and remove. Um, and it's failing where a reserve risky is not equal to uh, the expected. So if we do just a comparison uh, between these two numbers, um, it's a difference of one. Uh, it's basically a difference of one token um, on, on both the, the uh, reserve risky and the reserve stable balances. Um, this gives an, us an intuition for uh, looking at the code. And if there's a difference in those two values by one, most likely it's something to do with rounding, um, something to do with dust, um, which we can then find in, if we just compare um, the output the calculation of the allocate and the calculation of the remove. What we can see is that um, the calculation of the allocate is essentially calculating, uh, dividing by the reserve risky. Um, so if we were just to copy this into uh, what happens when an allocate happens, um, this is essentially the behavior that's executed. If we compare the output of the get amounts, um, this is what happens when we remove funds basically dividing by the amount of liquidity. Because in both cases, and I can just um, indent that for clarity, because in both cases we are dividing um, by the reserve or li the liquidity balance, essentially the incoming amount is being, the spot price in this case, being calculated, rounded, um, so divi uh, divided, truncated because it's using um, the division, and then on the remove is being truncated again, which means um, inverse from this, we can essentially tell that the inverse and the allocate functions are not actually related. They're not actually um, it, true inverses of each other. They are mostly inverses except for a dust value that um, essentially means that um, if someone executes, what this output means is basically if someone executes an allocate and then a remove, they may not get as much out of the system as they put in because this um, assertion failed um, log is printing out the total reserve stable um, pre-allocate and reserve stable post allocate, um, which, uh, which means that the post allocate balance is greater than the pre allocate, um, which you can see in the stable as well is the same case in which um, if from a user perspective, um, we can essentially see this to mean if um, a user calls uh, allocate with an argument and then remove with another set of arguments um, with the with the same amount, um, they get less from the system uh, when they execute the allocate and the remove in conjunction. So that's a long way to basically say that there is um, an invariant that's broken within this code base, just um, because the allocate and remove functions are not full inverses of each other.
um, an echidna can find um, these small corner cases when we compare the uh, pre-execution and the post-execution um, balances of these reserves. Any questions there? All right, perfect. Um, that's a lot of talking. Um, that's a lot of um, really thinking about what the system is supposed to do. Um, I just want to recap things that might be uh, useful in terms of um, how we got echidna working, how how we got started with testing this complex of a code base. Um, and one thing that always helps is the coverage file, um, seeing what reverted, seeing where things reverted, um, seeing where those uh, lines that are not being hit are. Um, so in the case of um, this last echidna run, we can see um, We can see the reserve if we just jump straight to uh, allocate then remove. We can essentially see that this uh, entire function was hit. It's set for a few reverts within the reserve allocate, um, but that the um, that that we actually got echidna to to hit um, the if statements that we expect or the assertions that we expect. Um, Starting with libraries and start with the smaller subsets of the system. This is this uh, reserve contract is a small subset of what the engine relies on in order for you to allocate and remove funds. And so starting with that and testing against that directly um, is helpful. Um, don't be afraid to mock um, your contracts and mock what you need to in order to get the system up. So in this case, we mocked um, essentially what the reserve is set up with. We made the assumption that the pool already exists because you can't have the reserve, um, y y they exist, the, the reserve cannot exist without a pool existing. Um, but we were able to isolate um, this logic into just a check against how the reserves are expected to work. Um, and more, most importantly, understand what is the system expected to do first. Um, so we spent a lot of time walking through the system, um, going through what, what the expected behavior is, what and how reserves are expected to work. Um, and doing that first is a, is a good practice so that you know essentially how, um, how to write more tests and, and what you're going to test um, after this. So on your end time, um, I would recommend looking at uh, the code uh, that we looked at today, um, understanding kind of the logic around uh, the allocate function, the remove and what we were testing um, and what bug we found with uh, the allocate, the remove. Um, and then looking at other libraries, something like units where it uh, does conversions between um, point 64 values and uh, integers and back and forth, um, looking at testing other libraries that are tangential to the system and rely, the engine relies on it in a similar way as the reserves do. Um, really just looking at the other libraries and seeing um, what invariants might come up. And um, I alluded to the end-to-end -end invariants uh, slightly in the create function, um, in the create function in kind of the, the existence of a pool and a pool uh, being created. Um, this was an example of one. Um, we can also see that in the deposit. So you can't, or in the allocate, you can't deposit, you cannot allocate to a pool um, if a pool does not exist, looking for further invariants that are end to end and kind of rely on the creation of pools, um, which is a spoiler. Uh, for next week and an even more complex setup. Um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'd highly recommend taking a look at the Echidna streaming series repo.
um, playing around with the code and just um, gaining a, a better understanding um, of what the system's supposed to do. Before Yeah, I, I was just about to ask, uh, were there any last questions before that? All right, perfect. Um, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week.